I will now call to order this meeting of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority this Thursday, January 20th, 2022. Happy New Year, everyone. And Madam um, Secretary, may you please call the roll. Good morning. Thank you. Chairperson Olivia Diaz. Here. Vice Chairperson William McCurdy. Present. Commissioner Scott Black. Here. Commissioner Valerie Craig. Present. Commissioner Sharon Davis. Here. Commissioner Michael Disman. Commissioner Tig Segerblum, Commissioner Dan Shaw, and Commissioner Luciana Turner. Present. A quorum is present, and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you, Ms. Cressley. And if we could please stand and um, follow us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Okay, we'll go to our second order of business, public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on this agenda for discussion and possible action. If you wish to be heard, come to the speaker's podium. Clearly state your name and address and please spell your name, last name for the record. The amount of time any single speaker is allowed will be limited to three minutes. Is there anyone wishing to offer public comment on posted agenda items at this time? Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item three, approval of minutes of the regular board meeting on December 16th, 2021. I have a first by Commissioner second. Sagerbloom and a second by Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, agenda item four, approval of agenda with the inclusion of any emergency items and deletion of any items. So this uh, agenda item is up for discussion or possible action. Is there anything that needs to be added or removed? No Seeing none, I have a first to approve of the agenda by Commissioner McCurdy. And a second by Commissioner Sagerbloom. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to section two of our agenda. We have our consent agenda item number five, which is an approval of request to write off outstanding tenant accounts receivable and vacated accounts for the period ending November 30th, 2021. Mr. Jordan? I'm sorry? Yes. So do do we need I guess I no. we don't have to speak. No. Okay. So the I'm just yeah. going to defer to the board. The board doesn't have any questions. Doesn't want to pull it forward for discussion. I have a motion to move this agenda item forward by M Commissioner McCurdy and a second. A second. By Commissioner Black. All those in favor please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that consent, uh, consent agenda item carries. Um, we're going now to section three, Commissioner Executive Director Recognitions. Um, we uh, first and foremost want to welcome our new Executive Director. He's been on the job since January 3rd, Mr. Lewis Jordan, um, and he's going to acknowledge our departed, Mr. Jordan. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, we're today uh, on our uh, departed list from Robert Gordon Plaza. We have William Maddox from Harry Levy Gardens. We have uh, Clarice Jensen, uh, James Down Towers. We have uh, Esperita uh, Pistariki from Arthur, Arthur Santini. We have Tommy Giles, Carmen Ramirez, and Anthony Lee. And from our scattered site program, we have Emma Doherty. And also, as we keep those individuals in our thoughts and prayers, also wanted to, um, to remind us of the passing of Senator Harry Reid, who was also a very, very big champion for affordable housing. So as we keep those individuals and their families in our prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. And we'll hold a moment of silence for all of those that have parted.
All right, we'll move on to section number four. Um, we don't have anything under section four, so we'll move on to section five, business items. So the, this section is to receive reports um, from either committee chairs and other folks. So first today we have a presentation from um, Nevada Department of Transportation on the planned expansion and improvements of the I-515 viaduct and the expected impact or possible impact on the properties of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. And with us, we have Mr. Ryan Wheeler, Senior Project Manager for the Nevada Department of Transportation. Welcome, Mr. Wheeler. There we go, thank you. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Chairperson Diaz and, and members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, Ryan Wheeler with the Nevada Department of Transportation and Project Manager over the Downtown Access Project. And if you remember, uh, we were here last April of 2021, and we're back again to give you a project update of where we're at on the schedule and, and moving forward. So I have a presentation and a series of slides. If you're okay, then I'll just go ahead and move, move through those, that presentation. Maybe. Maybe go back up there for me if you can. Or maybe it's not loading. It might just be page one. <laughs> oh, it's loading. Perfect. Sorry, it's a lot of intense graphics and things like that. So it might take just a little bit. I will say while we're waiting for that to load that uh, right now we uh, just opened our virtual public information meeting for January. And so a lot of the information that I'll be sharing with you today is on our website at uh, n.dap, so n-d-o-t, then d-a-p, downtownaccessproject.com. And uh, that's, that's open to the public virtually. We will also have an in-person uh, meeting on January 25th at the East Las Vegas Library as well. So, and, and when we meet in person on the 25th at the East Las Vegas Library, I'll, providing, I'll be providing a presentation at 5.30 p.m. There will be a court reporter there uh, to take comments as well. It looked like it might have loaded. Awesome. Awesome. You want to just scroll through or do you want me to try clicking? Are you good scrolling through? All right, let's head down to the next slide then. So today we'll go over a project overview. We'll talk about the design alternatives as a refresher. Um, we'll talk about our street closures. And last April we, we were in the midst of that and what the results of that were. Then we'll talk about the impacts to this property and then mitigating potential impacts and next steps. So next, let's scroll down. So this is our project. It's a long-term project, kind of like Project Neon was a while ago. We finished that in 2015. We are at the beginning of this long-term project. The important thing about the beginning of it is all the planning that goes into what the project is going to actually be. So during the environmental phase, which is the phase we're in right now as we're looking for feedback from the community to help us make good design decisions. Um, this project, the Downtown Access Project, is not the construction that's happening on the viaduct right now. Okay, that project is a $30 million project to repair um, uh, some issues with the bridges, do seismic retro, retrofits, uh, work on the deck, on the bridge itself. So this. The project that's out there right now is an interim project. The downtown access project is to widen the freeway uh, on, on, on US 95. Next slide. So why are we doing this? As you know, when you ride across that bridge, you're kind of going up and down, and, and the bridges are old. Uh, they're almost 60 years old and need to be remedied or replaced completely. Uh, that's, that's the major need is the bridges. If you scroll down some more, there's some other needs as well. Uh, the first bridge was built in 1968, the bridge that went from I-15 to Las Vegas Boulevard. The next one was built in 1980 that went from Las Vegas Boulevard to, to almost Eastern. And that worked well in the 80s, in the 90s, even 2000, but as the valley has continued to grow, 
we know that there's a lot of crashes here on this section of the freeway and, the, and we just get more and more traffic. So we need to expand the freeway through this area. Go ahead, next slide. So our goals um, for this project is to remedy the aging infrastructure, okay, fix the bridges somehow, do something with them, improve safety and operations through this portion of the freeway, improve the access to and from the downtown area, and, our, and add HOV lanes to this side of I-15. Go ahead. So we're evaluating three alternatives, and I'll introduce those to you shortly. Um, but in each alternative, we're planning to fix the ramp spacing because those ramps of Casino Center are too close to I-15. Um, we're going to add new lanes to the freeway. Uh, I shouldn't say new lanes, additional lanes. Um, we will do ramp braiding between I-15 and I-515. We'll add two new HOV interchanges, one at City Parkway and one right here at Maryland Parkway. And then we'll add bike and pedestrian mobility. Let's go to the next slide. So all of those improvements exist in each alternative that we'll show you. And we can send you these slides as well if you, if you need them afterward for your own reference. Definitely, we'll get them to you. Um, so the, the design alternatives, we're considering three right now. When we're done with the NEPA process, we will have one, okay? That's why we need that community feedback is to, to help us uh, make those decisions. So alternative one is to actually recess the freeway below ground. So today, if we walk out there, it's above ground, right? In the recess scenario, if we went down there, it would be below ground, like 20, 25 feet. Um, and to put it in a trench. All the cross streets, like Maryland Parkway, would then go over the top. The, the cross streets would stay at the existing elevation they're at today, but they would go over that trench that the freeway's in. Alternative two and three is to rebuild the freeway at a similar elevation than it is today, except not on a bridge that's 1.6 miles long. Most of it would be built on dirt, except for when we went over a street like Maryland Parkway, we'd have a bridge across. Alternative number four is a requirement that we have to consider as part of a Federal Highway Administration is what if we didn't do anything? What if we didn't expand the freeway at all? Go ahead. So I'll dive into each one of these alternatives a little bit to refresh your memories on what we're looking at. This is a typical section of the recessed freeway. In the middle, it shows where the freeway would be. Those earthen plugs just to the outside is, is the ramps to the local streets. So like to get up to Las Vegas Boulevard to access that local street, you'd have to come up and out of the freeway, out of the trench to access the street. And then the CD roads on the very outside um, are the ramps to and from I-15 and US-95. Let's go ahead to the next slide, thank you. And this slide, because it's a PDF, we weren't able to get the PowerPoint presentation over to you, but it's a video. So online, you can watch a, a video of what that would look like, okay? Um, so I would just reference you to, to look at those videos online. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Alternatives two and three is, is elevated, like I said, to a similar elevation of the bridge today, except instead of being on a bridge, it'd be built on dirt and we'd have our city roads off to the outside. Go to the next slide. The main difference between alternative two and three is really within this area. So we're looking you know, from 10th Street to the west and almost all the way to I-15. And we call them the north and the south alternative. The north is represented in blue. So this is just showing you a footprint of, of how it would snake through the downtown area, so to speak. So the blue area has more of a northern alternative where it impacts the facilities of, of the fire station and the city facilities uh, between Casino Center and Las Vegas Boulevard. The yellow alternative or the south alternative uh, pushes the freeway further to the south a little bit. It tries to stay away from the, the facilities, the city facilities of Fire Station, um, Senior Center, Dooley Gym, those that are right there in that area. But then it ends up impacting the Main Street Station parking garage, additional parking through the downtown area, as well as Eclipse, the Zappos parking garage. Uh, there by Las Vegas Boulevard. So that's really the main differences from a right-of-way perspective between the north alternative and the south alternative. Let's go ahead and keep going. Again, on the, on the website, you can watch a video of what that looks like, of it being elevated 
above ground. Uh, we also have a good tool on our website. Um, if you, if you hover your mouse over the resources tab, it'll take you to a virtual 3D world where you can pan around uh, the world itself and you can click between existing, um, recessed, north or south. And you can kind of get a vision of what that looks like when, when you're looking at prop potential properties that may be impacted depending on which alternative is selected. Let's go ahead and keep going. Uh, yeah, go down one more. So last time we were here, we showed you this graphic and we were in the middle of having temporarily closed these streets um, to say, hey public, this is what we're looking to potentially do is close up to eight streets. And this is illustrated by the red X's on this map. We were proposing, and I say we were as past tense because we've changed it, but we were proposing to close 7th, 8th, 10th, 14th and 16th and 20th, sorry, 14th and 16th and 19th Street, but then leave uh, 15th and 21st open to pedestrians only, not vehicles, but pedestrian bikes only. And then in the recessed alternative, we were proposing to close 4th Street just because we, we thought we couldn't make it work. If you'll scroll down a little bit, we went through this whole effort in actually closing those streets. And there's a picture of Councilwoman Diaz there. She helped us uh, kind of launch this and trying to drive uh, uh, the, the community, the local community, to, to provide feedback. And so when we did that, right, people don't talk when you're just trying to say, hey, we might build this project. But when we start closing streets, they start talking, right? Um, so we, we got 450 comments through this process, and we sure appreciate it. Uh, all of those comments because we're able to learn from the community that lives and uses those streets of hey This is important to me or this this I could maybe not deal with this or maybe not deal with the homeless as much or whatever their their uh, comments were so we really evaluate uh, really um, Are grateful for the feedback that we received from all 450 comments In addition to that we did an engineering traffic analysis to make sure that hey if we close these streets can the adjacent streets handle that additional capacity or do we need to do any improvements there? We also did what we call the origin and destination data, which gave us travel patterns of the community to see how often they were using the streets, both, both from walking to riding bikes to vehicle usage of each street. After doing all of that, we're like, wow, we need to, we need to adjust. And so if you scroll down, we're grateful to say that we listened to the public that we understand what the needs of the community were and instead of proposing to close eight or nine streets, we're now only proposing to close three streets. Those are now shown in the, in the red X's of 8th Street, 14th Street, and 16th Street. Um, in, and 19th is shown as an orange X because only in the recessed alternative, we have to close that one down as well because in order to bring that freeway down, as we go from Eastern Avenue down in the ground, we just can't uh, keep 19th Street uh, open. So we're, we heard the community, we're grateful for the feedback, and, uh, and this is our current proposed street closures. Let's go ahead and scroll down some more. So we're gonna review the potential uh, impacts to this property. We've updated this. Um, it changed just a little bit from when we were with you before. Um, so in each of the alternatives, here's the impact. So the office building north of 515 at 380 North Maryland Parkway, that one's impacted in all three alternatives. Um, the office building south of I-515 at 322 North 10th Street is not directly impacted by any of the alternatives. You'll have loss of parking spaces under the, under the freeway. Um, on the fourplexes north of I-515, in the south alternative, there's five buildings or 20 units. Uh, in the north alternative, it's the same. In the recessed alternative, because that one has the largest footprint to actually put a trench in the ground, there's actually 14 buildings, which is 56 units, which would be affected. Um, in the recessed alternative, there's a potential uh, that the property located at Cedar and 28th, which I believe is, is owned by your organization, may be impacted as well. Uh, Mr. Jordan, welcome. <laughs> I know this is difficult to hear, and hopefully you've been brought up to speed about this, but um, 
you know, we would love to come and meet with you separately. I'm sure in a different setting, uh, you would have more comments from us. And so we look forward to such additional uh, meetings. Let's go ahead and uh, keep going. So this is a, a, a aerial image of each alternative. We're looking at the recessed alternative and this is the widest footprint. And so that again has the largest impact for, for the, your facility, for your property. Uh, go down to, to the next two and the next two are less impactful. They're not as wide. And so you can see the impact to uh, the property there. In each one, we stay away from uh, moving further south. So the building that we're in is okay and the buildings uh, south of the freeway is okay. And most improvements are always to the north in each alternative. And you could go down to the next one, which will show you the south alternative, which is, should be mimic the north alternative, I think. It's pretty, pretty similar. Let's go ahead and keep scrolling down. So we'll touch base on where we're at and uh, and then we'll talk about next steps of where we're looking to go here in a little bit. What we're doing right now is we, as we had that community outreach about the street closures, we're now reaching out to the community to say, hey, we're, we need to mitigate some of our impacts and how do we do that? We, we as engineers just can't say, hey, I think you need a park here and this would be great. And then we walk away from the project and you have a park, right? We want to collaborate with the community on what they would like to see as enhancements around what, at least as far as what we can do within the limits of our right of way to offset some of these impacts. And so we're doing an outreach effort currently to collaborate with the community on that. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we have a, a survey uh, as part of our public information meeting where we're getting that type of feedback. And if you go to the next slide, this illustrates the kind of what we're looking to is we show 10 different improvements um, of, of potential things that may mitigate some of the impacts of a, a widened freeway. Uh, we also provide an option that if it's outside of these 10 impacts and you think it should be something else to let us know as well. Um, we want to hear from, from, the, from the people. We want this project to be as difficult as it is, is going to be with purchased property and a wide and freeway and additional lanes. We like to try to offset that the best that we can. So you can all get on the website and, and fill out that survey and help us receive that type of impact and, and, and encourage the residents you know, to do the same. All right, let's go to the next slide. So next steps, go ahead. Um, we're, so this NEPA process, as I showed you the, the, the schedule at the beginning is a three year process and we're, we're almost to the two thirds point through this process. This is kind of where we're at as we, as we work from the top to the bottom. At the end of the process, we'll have what we call a final EIS record of decision, which is a really fancy report. Um, through that report, we select a preferred alternative. And we're almost to that point where we're gonna select the preferred alternative. This shows you we are here right there. Um, come April, we're looking to select that preferred alternative. After we've selected the preferred alternative, we draft a report that says, this is the preferred alternative and this is why. We'll have another public hearing to allow the public to read that report, provide their comments, whether they like it or not, see if we need to make any additional tweaks, and then we finalize the report. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. How do we select a preferred alternative, right? We're looking at three. Um, here's kind of a high level list of criteria that we'll look at to make that decision. Um, this list is not all inclusive, but it would include impacts to the community, uh, environmental justice impacts, uh, noise, visual adjustments, uh, how many properties are, would need to be acquired and relocations would need to occur, what's the cost, um, how difficult is it to construct, you know, how, how, how long do we have to have orange cones up there, and then how difficult is it to maintain. Now this is just a list of a few high level items, but it's, again, it's not all inclusive. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. We're almost done here. Uh, this, is, this is a schedule um, of the NEPA process we are there in Q1 of 2022, where our public meeting is live, as I stated earlier. Um, and, and just a friendly reminder that the in-person 
presentation is January 25th at the East Las Vegas Library from uh, 4 to 7 with the presentation at 5.30. I encourage you to, to come, encourage you to share that with your residents and those interested to come and, and provide comment as well. We will have a court reporter there that, uh, the, that, that makes all those comments part of our documentation, part of our environmental report. As we move forward um, in Q2, we will select the preferred alternative. Um, we'll draft that environmental document. We'll, we'll publish that for the public to, so that they have that environmental document and can see why we made the decisions that were made. We'll have another public hearing the end of this year to uh, hear their comments on the environmental report, and then we look to finish. At the end of 2023, just so you know, uh, then we have this nice report, environmental report that says, here's what NDOT is going to build. What happens after that? What happens after that is we move into the right-of-way acquisition phase and the design phase, and that's about another four years, and then we look to start construction around 2027. All right, let's go to the next slide. I think I've talked about our public meeting enough, but uh, this is just reiterating what I've already illustrated to you about that. Please visit our website, n.dap.com. And virtually it's open till uh, February 15th. So with that, I appreciate uh, Councilwoman Diaz and the board. Thanks for letting me come back. I appreciate it. And, and we like to stay in touch. We like to be transparent. Councilwoman Diaz is very aware of this. Um, we like to keep people aware of, of what we're doing and what's changed. And uh, we're always available by a phone call. Debbie, my colleague in back here, uh, is our community liaison. Uh, she's been out in the community taking surveys uh, and, and uh, we're here to answer any questions. So Councilwoman Diaz, board, any, any questions that I might be able to? Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. I'm sure uh, some of our board members have questions for you. So we'll start with Commissioner I Craig. I say, first I had a question about the trench, but you, I thought I did a good job this time. But I just, this is small. Just what is ramp braiding? I know hair gets braided and you braid, braid material together. What is ramp braiding? That's all yeah, so I'll give you kind of an example of where ramp braiding is in the valley, and that's kind of what it is. So if you think of uh, when we did Project Neon and US 95 coming southbound before it runs into I-15, before Project Neon was built, it came right up onto I-15 and it had a conflicting point with people trying to get off on Charleston off of I-15. Well, now today, when you, when you take US 95 South, you turn and you go adjacent to I-15, almost all the way to Sahara, and then you merge on to I-15. And that allows like ramp braiding, like Charleston, your I-15 Charleston exit to come down to Charleston. And that, uh, that road from US 95 doesn't conflict with uh, that off ramp anymore. So that's, that's what ramp braiding is. There's another example in the valley, like down on 215. I probably shouldn't share this the one with you, but we'll go to Henderson, how about that? Out in Henderson at the Henderson Spaghetti Bowl, um, you have those elongated ramps uh, coming from Henderson towards Las Vegas uh, that they ramp braid with like, uh, they, they remove the conflict point dealing with auto show drive. Yeah, so that's what it is. Does that help? Did I help answer that a little bit or no? Sometimes it's hard. As, in, as engineers, we talk about one thing and people are like, what? So hopefully that helped. And Commissioner Craig, I think that if you do go on the website and you watch the videos, I think it, it makes it a little bit more clear to understand what the ramp braiding will entail. So yeah. I, I highly encourage if you go to the, um, it's n.dap.com. Yep. So go to that, and I've seen them because they've played them for me before um, in a one-on-one -on -one -on -one meeting, and it does help understand a lot of this engineering yeah. um, gobbledygook that we don't, and layman people don't understand, but engineers totally get. So I do have another question or comment from Commissioner Shaw. Yeah. Do you have any idea of the time frame between uh, once you've made your decision on which alternative and uh, appraisal of our property and the need for us to vacate? Yeah, um, so good question. <laughs> so as far as idea on time frame is that, 
So the NEPA process ends, is supposed to end Q2 2023. The next phase, which is right-of-way acquisitions and design, is a four-year phase and is not yet funded. So by the time we get to Q2 of 2023, we anticipate that next phase will be funded. If it is funded, we'll move right into that phase. In that phase, we will uh, set right away. I, let, let me try and be succinct here. <coughs> we would probably be meeting with your organization a year or two into that about um, what, the act, what the appraisal value is and, and those negotiations of appraisal value and relocation, how would it happen? Um, with Mr. Jordan, in some of our separate meetings, we wouldn't mind having discussions on what, what maybe the organization's high-level thoughts are about that. Um, but, but that's up to you guys whether he even wants to have that discussion with me. But so, so, so about three or four years. Okay. okay. So, so I was going to say, so 23 to end the NEFA process and mm -hmm. then up to four years, I guess. So you're four or five years maybe. Um, if everything, if the next phase gets funded, I would say two to three years. In two years, we'd probably start serious start discussions the, the discussion. with you about value of the property and right. potential relocations. Okay. Um, one thing for sure, obviously, is we cannot build the project until we have the space to build right. the project, right? And mm -hmm. so um, not only do we acquire property, but we assist in relocating whatever that looks like. And obviously, I don't think you want to use them in a domain. So right. you're better off to talk. Right. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Turner. Um, good morning or good afternoon, should I say. Um, and, and hearing some of these things that are going to happen in the future sounds like jobs to me. Sounds like employment opportunities. And I would hope that um, Mr. Jordan would take a look at that and maybe, um, I don't know, about some of our residents that might be unemployed, maybe some training that can go on so when the actual construction starts, maybe some of our residents or people, you know, in our community will benefit from that. So I'd like for you to, you know, remember that when you're having these negotiations about displaced uh, residents and those people that may be unemployed or even to start receiving some training so they'll be ready for NDOT's changes. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent point. And we'll talk to Mr. Jordan about that for sure. And we do write those types of things in our contracts. Uh, so that's something we can look at. Any other questions from the board? Commissioner Black? I have one question, Mr. Wheeler. Um, on the three options, I'm assuming that they're not in any particular order in terms of preference or ranking. It's just one, two, and three. Um, in terms of the the trenched option with the wider footprint has that been done in other areas with a, a level of success and if so what other large metropolitan areas have a trenched freeway system such as that excellent question and first let me address the first one that though you're correct we list them one two three and it's not in any preference uh, to date and dot does not have a preference and we're waiting to finish all our reports before we get into that mode of looking at a preferred alternative. As far as other communities that have done this, uh, Denver just completed a project uh, where they have a freeway and a trench. Uh, I think uh, and they, there was a school nearby and they ended up putting a soccer field over the freeway. Uh, they, they actually capped the freeway and when it was down a trench, they actually put a bridge over it and then put a soccer field on the bridge. Um, there's a community down in uh, it's called Clyde Warren Park, I think, in Dallas, Texas, that was one of the first in the nation to um, lower a freeway. And then they ended up, again, putting a, a cap over the freeway. So I might point out that Houston has done this extensively, and they become giant flood basins every time it rains in Houston. Yeah. So I'm assuming you're going to have answered all those questions. Yeah, and, and let me let on. me be clear here too that uh, as far as the Department of Transportation is concerned, you know we help people get from A to B and, and, and build freeways. Um, we don't necessarily build uh, caps. And with that said, you know there's been talks that hey maybe a cap could mitigate the impact. And so far, our, our environmental team has said that. Um, 
the level of impact is not such that it would warrant uh, capping the freeway because recessing the freeway in and of itself, it makes it better visually and it makes it uh, better from a noise perspective and is an overall benefit that kind of matches the impact that is being realized. So just FYI. I guess we do have one here that our airplanes land on. Um, yes. It goes under the, the airport, so. You do, and also me, Desert so. Inn, it, you know, it, it lowers as you come from the west side of the freeway to the east side of I-15. It lowers through the, um, what's that area called? The, yeah, the strip, but the, where everybody goes for meetings and powwows. <laughs> what is it, Debbie? <laughs> Thank you, Convention Center. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. You're welcome. Commissioner Sagerblum. So, um, as I saw, none of the alternatives is this building actually taken down? This building that we're in? Yes. No. Okay. But this building, all, all, the, all the impacts are north of the freeway, not south of the freeway. But you'd, you'd, you'd be impacted during construction, but the building would not need to be relocated. You could still operate out of this building. You would lose parking, yes, under the, under the bridges. So I mean, you probably can't answer this, but if we lose our parking, it seems like the, the building would not function the way we want it to function. So hopefully we could get you to pay for the building too. <laughs> All of that is gonna have to happen during the right of way phase, right? Lots of questions um, that, that I don't have answers for and would have to take place during that right of way phase when we're ready to have those discussions. But we recognize obviously that parking is impacted and if, if that's not replaced nearby, can this operate? So all good questions. I just don't have answers for them right now. I have a quick question. If no other commissioners have a question, because everyone's had amazing questions, but um, my question relates to the expediency in which we'll be able as a housing authority to receive the funding to relocate our tenants. So what and I don't want to envision is the project starting up and a lot of folks being displaced because in all the scenarios, it seems like most of it will have a heavy impact on Robert Gordon uh, tenants and residents. And so how quickly can those conversations happen saying that they started 2024, 2025, how quickly can we receive funding to ensure that we're built out and relocating folks before we have to displace folks when you're about to start the project. Does that make sense? Because a project yeah. and building new residence yep. sees for people are, are finding the land, finding the yeah. project, funding all of the mechanisms, then getting it accomplished takes a lot of time. So I want to make sure that we do have significant lead time in trying to accomplish our objective and not displace any folks. As we know right now, we're having a huge crisis with um, available um, housing to mm -hmm. our, our residents. So can you kind of give us an indication as to how quickly this process can work? Because I know you can't tell me what will happen or transpire, sure. but how, how quickly can we see that moving along? I would say that everything you said we'd be fully on board with. Um, and as soon as a value is agreed upon, right, through, act, through appraisals and whatnot, that the money would be right behind it. Um, yeah, so we're, we're fully on board with that and recognize that there are sensitivities here that will have to occur during additional discussions a few years down the road. And all I could say is we'll work with you not just to acquire, but to relocate, whatever that may look like. Right, there's some difficult, not, not just your property, but there's other properties that are difficult along this corridor to, to relocate. One of them's the city fire facility, right? Same situation. They may need a new building to operate out of before we can, before we can widen the freeway at that point. And similar to how you guys are, he are here is we may need to make sure you're fully relocated or, or whatever the case is so that you continue your operations without, without difficulty. So. All I can say, uh, Councilwoman Diaz is, or Chairperson Diaz, is that we're committed uh, to meet your goals as we go through this process. And the money, again, as soon, will be available as soon as, uh, as, soon as uh, negotiations are complete on acquisitions. All right, and then um, I know that also the Cedar and 28th property 
um, could potentially, but I just wanted to remind you again that there may be, hopefully, if that's the option we move forward with, we don't know if recess, because I know recess yeah. is the one that impacts that mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that there's some units also attached to that land that mm -hmm. used to be there. So I just wanted, again, put it on your radar to look at a, a further lot that the city has that's more on um, Mojave um, okay. across from the golf course as an option for, I know you have okay. to create some sort of, um, what is it called? Like a draining mechanism? Drainage basin, yes. yeah, yeah. So just wanted to kind of put that again on the table that if we could work around not having an impact on that lot and maybe potentially doing the other one further down, just yeah. to remi remind you all of that one. Yeah, appreciate that. And I think that we've talked about that in your office to, to, to that there's two different options down there that might be able to not impact that property as much. Detention so. basin. I just it detention just came to basin. Me. <laughs> yes, storm detention basin. Yes. All right. Well, we appreciate NDOT coming. Um, are there any questions that you may have, Mr. Jordan? But I'm sure you're going to have a follow-up meeting after. Yes. Just looking forward to the conversation, and I'll brief the board on what comes out of that. Absolutely. Okay. And I think Debbie has already provided you the PDFs. If not, we'll make sure you have those, and then we'll make sure we're establishing contact afterwards for a follow-up meeting. Very good. Okay. Thank you for the notice about the January 25th meeting happening at East Las Vegas um, Library from 4 to 7. So please, anyone who lives here, if we can notice our residents, I think that would be wise for them to also start digesting this information. Um, anybody who has interest to just be educated and informed about the timelines because sometimes we we hear about it and we think it's going to happen like next year but really we're significantly you know five six seven years away from even the project getting underway so um, just I appreciate your time and coming today Mr. Wheeler thank you for that report all right thank you thank you everyone thank you all right, we'll move down to um, Section 5, Item 8, receive a report from our Executive Director on Administrative and Operational Activities of the Agency, Mr. Jordan. Good afternoon again. I'm, uh, so I wanted to start off by saying I'm real excited to be here. The, um, I'm settling in. Both staff and the community has been quite inviting as I, as I move forward. I'm trying to balance my time between you know, working with staff, uh, residents, community partners, and you. I know you've received a number of calls uh, as I'm trying to get on your schedules just so that we can make sure that we're aligned. I've, I've had an opportunity to attend one or two community meetings. And one of the things that uh, I'm glad we're participating in but would like to see us enhance is our ability to address the homeless issue in the community. So we're. Uh, looking to, you know, to really continue to build on that effort. Uh, I wanted to mention that we've kicked off our process for the Choice Neighborhood Implementation, which is a uh, planning grant to develop Marble Manor in support of the overall 100 plan. So we're starting those conversations. Um, we'll be contacting you to help you understand what your roles can be as we uh, develop a communication strategy, bring HUD in, to showcase um, you know, what we're doing and why we need to do it. Also want to mention that we're gonna begin a beautification process to upgrade our customer lobbies, both the lobby in the Section 8 area as well as the lobby out on Flamingo. You know, we want to make sure that we're providing a, uh, a, a very inviting um, venue for folk to come in as we look to serve them and so we're uh, going to start with the Flamingo office and things like paint, better lighting, you know, furniture change, all being uh, cognizant of COVID and social distancing. But again, just a little spruce up of the, uh, of the lobby areas. Uh, let's see, we received $1.7 million Ross grant from HUD. It was one of the larger ones in the, uh, in the country. The Ross grant helps us to provide services for our family self-sufficiency program. And currently we're serving uh, 508 families in that program. And I think that's a record for the, uh, for the agency. And these funds will help us to further uh, support those families. And then finally, I wanted to announce that I attended and participated in the uh, MLK parade on Monday. And I'm looking forward to ways to, um, that 
In the future, our housing authority can be a participant in the parade as we highlight some of the great accomplishments of, of our families that we serve. And Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Any questions or comments from the board for Mr. Jordan regarding his report? Seeing none, um, thank you, Mr. Jordan, for hitting the ground running. I want to laud and congratulate also our Department for Family Self-Sufficiency for all the yeoman's work that they do day in and day out and for receiving this amazing grant opportunity. I think it's going to be uh, an awesome next graduation that we get to attend, I'm sure, because we all left oud and odd from the last one we just attended back in, what was it, October, November? Wow, it, time kind of flies by. Um, and I'm really excited about the opportunities that lie ahead for Marble Manor and that um, planning grant that we received and, and we're co cooperating, I know, with uh, my city, the mm -hmm. city of Las Vegas, and, and building this vision. And of course, our residents will have um, ample participation and opportunities to learn and, and voice uh, what matters the most to them and, and helping us craft Absolutely. a vision. So I wanted to also mention that, that we're not leaving anyone out. Everyone is in, uh, going to be invited in all of this process. So um, thank you so much. I, I love the idea about participating in a future MLK parade or any events that Absolutely. maybe speak to us um, as, as a board or as a, an agency. Um, that we highly encourage um, us to be active participants in our community because we are here about building community and we are part of the fabric yeah. in Clark County. So thank you for that advice. All right, um, number nine is identifying emerging issues to be addressed by the board and the executive director at future meetings. Are there any emerging issues that any of the commissioners would like to bring up at this time? Okay, we have... Um, Ms. Turner, Commissioner Turner gunned you first, so I'm going to go to Commissioner Turner because she had her light on, and then we'll go to Commissioner Craig. Okay. Well, um, I had a chance to go to a conference last week, and it was a wonderful experience. I learned so much. Um, moving forward, um, one of the hot topics or one of the key uh, um, things they talked about was the digitization of everything, and we had... Um, somewhat talked about that and how we can move forward in this digital age and and I just would like to know how that is happening um, how we're still moving forward if it's meeting our needs with the companies or companies will decide to use for that digital transformation to make sure that it's the ease of the staff and the, and the, um, the residents and you know how we communicate and get all paperwork and everything together so I was just interested in how we would, you know, keep moving forward. Uh, we currently have a RFP on the street. <clears throat> we'll be trying to finalize that next week. We will have a presentation um, from one of the finalist vendors that uh, have bidded on that particular project. Uh, we are looking to amend the project to include some Wi-Fi services as well. Uh, the RFP was written to uh, upgrade the IT infrastructure for the entire agency. Uh, so we have a budget uh, for that. Uh, we will have a presentation on the 25th. And then from that standpoint, we're looking to finalize and move forward uh, from that scenario. So Mr. Jordan, is this uh, something that can be brought back to the board um, within a month or two so that we can kind of see what the lay of the land is. Where are we currently with our our progress in technology implementation? And um, obviously, we want to continue to go more paperless um, yes. because we know one, it will create more space for our employees to hopefully work in um, comfortably. Because uh, I've walked some of the Section Eight departments, and it's just we need to to definitely remedy that. Um, and then to like. What are other areas that obviously besides paperless, I know you've mentioned right away DocuSign Correct. to expedite uh, matters and, and you know, use our times more efficiently. So if you can just kind of give us a, a report back to the board as to what are things that we're continuing to strive and improving in our practice and our efficiencies with technologies so that we're 
We're informed where we are and where we still need to go because I know that constantly technology is innovating and is everything is outdated the day you implement it. Mm -hmm. And so I know it's a work in progress. So where are we at? What are we striving to achieve? And then what do we still need to look forward towards accomplishing as an agency? So sure. I think that would be well received by the board. Uh, Commissioner Craig, and then I have Commissioner Stegerbloom. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, say that the conference that uh, we went to commissioner's co conference. I can't, it was past 100%. I just learned so much, I'm sure. And Commissioner Luciano, we just learned so much. And I thank her for that question because I was concerned about the digitization. I used to work as a nurse and we used to do paper. And a lot of ch medications, a lot of orders, and a lot of things got lost with paper. And though I do believe that the individuals here at the Housing Authority, the clerks do try to do a good job. However, we really, 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 maybe I need to turn our plates down and fast and pray, whatever it takes, give contributions. We really, 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 really need to get a hold on the paper that's being lost and the time that's being lost. And I learned that at the conference, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, my concern is, um, Usually, I anticipate that Luciana would ask commissioner would ask something about the section th uh, three program. Is that what it is? Whenever people get to work, and I say in the top of my head, even when that gentleman was talking, they say they have those jobs available and they say they're going to have training. And my question is, is it just something that you're saying or something you're really going to do? And what do I mean? Oh, we've got training, but then the the, the, the skills that are necessary are too high for us. So my question is, I just hope that they will consider when they come here and talk to us that they're going to have something that we can do in the housing authority. And the training may be they're going to be building the highway like by 2023 20, or 24. Well, if that's so, maybe we can get some adequate training for individuals that are in the housing authority starting in 2022. I really, really mean that because we need the money. And even if we go uh, like uh, he said, he went to the Martin Luther King uh, parade. The thing about it is, and what kinds of things can we do even when we're going to the Martin Luther King Parade, utilizing those of us who work here? That's all I have to say. I think she's going to recognize me, so I'm going to recognize myself. Yes, Commissioner Sagerbloom, your turn. Oh, thank you. Um, I say that uh, county, we, we're actually putting together an internet plan. We have a lot of federal money. Um, and so it might be useful to reach out to the housing authority and, and make sure we even put the internet into the, the existing building so that everybody has great access, you know, um, and, and it, because it, we're, we're mandated to do poor areas as well as other areas. So this would be, I think would fit into that. Great observation there, Commissioner Sager Bloom. Do we have a survey that tells us about, um, just our public housing or affordable housing properties that we manage and what the quality of internet service and access is in the area. Cause there's parts in my, my sure. city area that I get complaints about from my residents that they only can get Cox, but it's, it's out of, out of uh, cost for them. It's expensive. And so they don't have any other opportunities to, figure out another company to go to, but it's just, you know, $90 a month sometimes is out of reach for many of our families. And the quality is kind of hit or miss with some of the providers as well. Do we know where we stand with all of our properties in terms of um, internet access or Wi-Fi access? I would defer that to Terrence. Please, Terrence, go ahead. Yes, we're well aware of uh, our equipment that we currently have in all of our buildings. We will be putting together a Wi-Fi plan. Uh, we just, uh, I just wrote a statement of work last week to include the Wi-Fi upgrade and development at all of our facilities. We met with uh, the city of North Las Vegas yesterday in regards to their particular project that uh, we were made aware of uh, to include the residents from that standpoint. So we are working toward uh, putting infrastructure in and Wi-Fi on top of that. So we, we agree with the overall sentiment in order for us to not only provide, you know, shelter, we also need to be in the business of providing services that can help our residents move towards self-sufficiency. So we'll, we'll look at, uh, we'll be, we can prepare a report for the board to show where we are and where we need to be. And uh, I definitely like the idea and to the extent that we have not done, done it, we will. 
look to see how we can partner and collaborate with the jurisdictions. Uh, Commissioner uh, Diaz, you're right. There, um, there are companies, and I'm not sure if Cox is one, that will offer a reduced rate for low-income families. And so we'll, we'll explore, if we have not, we'll explore all those options. But just even the broadband infrastructure, and right now just having the side conversation with the vice chair, uh -huh. I misspoke with Wi-Fi. Well, Wi-Fi works if you have good broadband, broadband. or yeah. fiber, right? And sometimes that it has not been updated for many, 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 many years. And back to Commissioner Sagerbloom's point, if we can leverage you know, intentional targeting of certain neighborhoods that have been left behind because they are more mature, they are older, and the infrastructure there is outdated, this is a prime opportunity to try to put those on the map. I would agree. And I, I think just in general, um, our where we are technology-wise as an organization is not nearly where we, we should be. And so staff is working on updating, you know, everything from internet access to broadband capability, not only for our residents, but for our office as well. And uh, Vice Chair McCurdy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I mean, this is a perfect, you know, timing for the conversation that we're having because uh, with the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, mm -hmm. there are going to be, you know, billions of dollars released to Nevada. And as much as we can do to have a conversation with our other municipalities and agencies, for instance, Clark County, the city of Las Vegas, Henderson, North Las Vegas, um, we should be able to tap into leveraging uh, the opportunities that, that we will have when they open up the ground. Uh, one thing that we've identified is that um, of all the you know surrounding states, we know that Clark County in its entirety uh, only has about you know uh, thirty percent of fiber, whereas when we talk about somewhere like Chattanooga, Tennessee, they have like a hundred percent. So we have a unique opportunity uh, to to you know improve access, particularly in, in the area of fiber. Uh, but also, you know, with these federal dollars that are coming, you know, on, on, online to us. So I think we just connect you with our municipality. I know that we can do what we can from the county, do the same thing with the city and just see where we, you know, can, can get together and, you know, not duplicate services, but also, you know, just provide that connectivity. So I think it's a good idea. And uh, I thank the, the chairwoman for bringing that forward and also uh, Commissioner Sagerbloom. So I think it's a, a phenomenal opportunity. And know there will be a, a welcome seat at that table. Absolutely. All right, back to Commissioner Craig. And here we are again. We're talking about the infrastructure, and we're talking about education. We're talking about jobs, and I really, truly, honestly want them to consider us. Uh, it, you know, working with the, I had to do it. All of that kind of stuff. Consider us, and then, if it's training, a year, one or two years worth of training, for those of us that live here. You know, so that we can be part of, the, you know, working with the infrastructure sure. so that we can be part of what's happening even within the clerical system, because we can even do things in the clerical system. And I'm saying that training and all of that, you know, projecting it one or two years. Please look at us. Absolutely. Please think it. Look at us. Now I'm doing Luciano's thing. She's not doing it, but I've done it for her. All right. Commissioner Desmond. Yes. Um, just on the subject a little bit different. Um, as you know, I'm new here, and my first uh, meeting that I attended of the subcommittees, some of the uh, properties were having so much frustration with maintenance and security issues. And uh, in fact, it, it kind of stuck to me because one of the ladies, and I think she's in here now, was stating that when, she, when you would pull up to one of the properties, it looked like Sanford and Son. You see, and I was just struck by that. And uh, so I'm wondering, do we have a mechanism where we as a commissioner hearing something like this can be of assistance to them of making certain that the follow up to their needs and requests, which had reached a point of frustration, uh, can be met? Because I'm real, I mean, they were so frustrated in, in reporting to us over and over and uh, some of the tenants were afraid to go outside and this and that. And uh, uh, I know the experience of that kind of a situation. It's just horrible to live in that kind of a thing. And I'm wondering how we can make certain that through the, the system, uh, 
with you, um, Mr. Jordan, and otherwise can follow up and that we can get some kind of feedback to know that some of these issues have definitely been addressed and what the results are. Mr. Jordan. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Dismin, it starts and stops right here. I can be that conduit for the board, um, make sure the items are addressed, mm -hmm. and make sure the proper follow-up is given back to you. Yes, sir. So to your question, Mr. Dismin, just reach out to Mr. Switch, Jordan, whether that's me. email, phone yeah. call, um, relay the concern or the matter that yeah. you, you want him to do his due diligence on, make sure it take, you know, and he'll explain. <laughs> Sometimes we can do things overnight. Um, sometimes it may take a little bit longer. It just depends on what the issue is and what the process we need to go through to accomplish the, the end result. The, the key is the responsiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, I also and want to mention that, see, uh, again, Mr. Grassley took me on a, a tour of all our properties so I could physically see myself in some of the areas where the need is overwhelmed and I could see why some of the persons are really relating to the particular issues that they were frustrated with. So if I can kind of or some of us can get some feedback from you when you've had an opportunity to settle in and deal with some of those issues because I'm really, really concerned that, that I think they've reached a level of frustration that Absolutely. is just, uh, okay, thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and uh, close that part of our agenda and move on to the last uh, item, which is the second round of citizen participation. Items raised under this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated on or acted upon by the Board of Commissioners of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority until the notice provisions of the open meeting law have been complied with. If you wish to speak on matters not listed on the posted agenda, please step up to the podium and clearly state your name and spell out your last name and give us your address, your address and um, for the record. The amount of time any single speaker is allowed will be limited to three minutes. Is there anyone wishing to give public comment or citizen participation? Seeing none, oh. Oops, I was gonna say I'm gonna make a public comment. That's the first time there's ever been public comment. But, <laughs> but no, there is a public we'll comment. We'll invite the lady up. Please make sure you give us your first name, spell out your last name and uh, you may start your three minutes. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you. And all of you, it's nice to see, other than Facebook, it's nice to see you in person. Um, my name is Rosemary Flores, F-L-O-R-E-S. And um, I don't live in the district that I'm going to be, going to be speaking on. But um, I live at 597 Riverbed Street, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89110. The reason I came today is to speak on behalf of the senior citizens, the elders without internet at Marble Manor. We're talking about people that have been posted 30-day um, notice to vacate due to the fact that they don't have internet, they don't even know how to use a computer or cannot use a computer due to the, the, their disabilities. And the reason I'm here today, because I have a family member that is disabled, that does not have internet, cannot afford it, and lives at Marlboro Manor. He brought this to my attention, and so therefore, I reached out to the housing authority and left a voicemail, and they contacted me back. But first, I spoke to an advocate for that, for this reason. I did speak to um, the office manager and she did disclose a copy of my brother's late fees, and not only late fees, since March of 2020, when you had your, fur, your uh, change of how to pay the rent, the system, the new system of how they pay the rent. Now, we should all be able to accommodate the disabled the elderly, the people that can't even remember where their keys are. And, you know, you want them to pay their rents on through the internet. My brother tried to take some um, money orders which were rejected, which cost him some late fees, which cost him a 30-day notice, and probably is going to cost him a hospital bill. Due to the fact that 
um, he has a heart, heart condition and thinking that he is going to be evacuated from his home in 30 days. So I went and took the liberty of taking the copies. I see late fees due to the for the, due to the fact that they wouldn't accept the money orders anymore. He was treated very, very badly by your personnel at Marble Manor, at the office, and he keeps complaining about a lady named Monica. We keep hearing this name on and off throughout the year. It's time for her, it's time for retraining of your help, of your uh, workers, Maybe you can get some funding to retrain all of your workers on anger management classes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flores, um, for sharing your brother's frustration. And um, obviously that's not the kind of customer experience that our board wants to hear that is being offered to our residents. And so Mr. Jordan, you're new, you're hearing this. I'm sure that um, you know, you have some thoughts about how we can be doing better, but is there someone that um, can reach out to Ms. Flores' brother or to her and try to facilitate and see where the misstep is and how we can provide further support and guidance? Because I know that we did adopt the Rent Cafe, but again, even in going through the pandemic and when we all as electeds went through that exercise of having to inform our community of um, how to get tested, how to get vaccinated. A lot of it was very technology driven, make your appointment online. And I kept saying, but there's so many people in our community that don't necessarily have the digital skills. So how do we ensure that everyone in our community, especially those that need the support the most, are receiving the support or a, a, a phone number to call or um, an agency that's helping um, our folks with with that deficit of technology skills. Because I don't, you know, I have parents who are afraid to touch a computer because they say they're gonna break it. So I, I feel we do have to have some empathy and some compassion for our residents that might be in a similar situation. So I just, you know, I know we're not supposed to go back and forth on the comments, but if we can connect Ms. Flores with anyone to help with this area would be greatly appreciated. Yes, we'll speak to Ms. Flores right after the meeting and I, I uh, fully concur and um, agree that, that as we work in the public sector, we need to continue to find ways to have enhanced, uh, enhanced um, um, awareness around the special needs of our population. And I, I just wanted to say that I know that the staff is working towards that that end every single day, but we'll continue to look for ways in which we can improve our service delivery, particularly as it relates to the diversity of the population we serve. All right, any anyone else wishing to offer? Okay, go ahead and state your name, ma'am, first and last name, and you have your three minutes. Uh, my name is Xiu uh, Mengguo, last name G U O from 5,000 water dry Las Vegas, uh, uh, apartment two in Las Vegas, Nevada, Nevada, A9107. Okay, okay. Um, I complain about they tow my car um, for no reason. Last time, uh, last year I complained they tow uh, my car no reason. This time they do again. Um, I, got, I got sticker, but uh, this time I was uh, tell the uh, system manager, Jerry, uh, I already give um, donate the car and I'm not driving. Um, months ago, she told me I have to move the, my car. So, I, so uh, they saw the car don't work. Um, every year, I um, clean my car or the pipe. pipe. Uh, this, I I pay I pay my car very much, and uh, every every year, about three years a row, all got the um, new battery. So uh, they saw my car don't work. My cars work. 
and the reason I don't, I'm not driving yet, I was going to uh, donate. I tell the, I see the manager a couple of weeks ago, but the last Tuesday, they told my car away. I, 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 um, I got so mad, I even don't want to you know, talk to them again. So this manager, um, this is one, almost one year, they changed uh, four times the manager. So um, I don't know uh, who to talk. And um, the car, uh, told, told the car back or not, uh, I'm not mine. But uh, they've been doing this, you know, uh, made me uh, so mad. Understand, um, understand completely um, the towing practice uh, is expensive for oh. anybody's car who gets okay. towed. So um, I, I can pay the tow, but there's no reason the manager, a season manager, they know me. That the season manager tell me uh, my car have to move. I can move, I have to call my son. My son, the, he working regular hour every uh, Monday to Friday, eight to five. So um, he really don't have time, he got three little kids. So uh, I, I just, um, this time, uh, the weekend, he just moved the car, and they, uh, Tuesday, last Tuesday, they moved, they towed my car. All right, so again, Mr. Jordan, can we have someone help? Ms. Is it Go? Ms. Go, you Go. Yes, we will. Okay. Thank you. Any further public comment or citizen participation at this time? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.